One chapter books? What? Welcome to the Joyous Expansion Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Dupree, scouring the globe to bring you stories of courage, passion, and resilience. If I could sum up this podcast into one word, I would use empathy. Now let's get inspired. Welcome to the Joyous Expansion Podcast. I am your host once again, Brett Dupree, here to drop some spiritual knowledge on you. Today we're talking to W.T. Hamilton, who's going to talk about writing books about the law of attraction. He writes books one chapter at a time. That is an interesting way of releasing them, but it's also an interesting way of getting your message out there. But first, I talk about what's going in my life, because I do not talk about my life, and I do not become vulnerable. How can I expect my guests to be vulnerable as well? This has been an interesting week upon me. Uh, One of the most interesting parts is my weight's going up and I've been eating well. And that's been frustrating. Very frustrating. That aspect of it has brought some thoughts in my head. And unfortunately yesterday I'd had too many of those negative thoughts and I kind of lashed out and ate a lot of ice cream. So I had ate ice cream practically all day yesterday. Had an ice cream day. And the ice cream day where I should have got my podcast out. Instead, I just watched New Girl and ate ice cream. I was like a 15-year-old girl who uh, got dumped on her period type of day. Was That was my yesterday. But nothing bad happened. It was just a day where I just felt like a disappointment. Where I felt like a failure. Those days happen in life. And a lot of it sometimes is this podcast a lot of it sometimes but thing is is i'm not doing that bad i had this interview on monday or tuesday monday and he was talking about what his life after this well life activation is what this guy did and i got one of those as well and then he was talking to his person who did it for him and he's like life is normal but but then he talked about all the good things that happened and that got me to thinking about my life as well even with yesterday's kind of teen ink sadness i guess i would say just you know sometimes life feels overwhelming and i think yesterday was a day it was just it hit me And, you know, as I've talked many times, I'm good at lying to myself about things. Luckily, I have an amazing girlfriend, and we had conversations. And there's something about talking to somebody about things that put things in perspective. It's like things can go through your head and make so much sense. But when you say them out loud, you recognize how stupid you're being. And I had one of those moments, as I'm sure every guy has ever had a girlfriend had those moments, where I was saying things out loud to her. I'm like, huh, that doesn't make sense. What the heck were you thinking? And maybe that played a part in the feeling of yesterday. But I don't think it really played too much. I think it was just everything. But even on Monday, I was thinking about that. And I'm still thinking about what was today, if I were to explain what happened since, I think it was two years ago when I got first life activated, and what changed. And at first, it just felt negative, because that's when my roommate left and honestly it was probably for the best as that was not a good scenario she's one of the most abusive people i've ever been around a lot somebody who never took responsibility for anything she ever did and having a female roommate's weird period yeah just someone who wouldn't take responsibility and just felt like on eggshells and i hated going home so her moving out technically wasn't a bad thing It just ended poorly as well as losing out on that cool $600 a month she spent in not even appreciating the fact that I was practically subsidizing her living to a certain point just to be nice. But because I was paying double that if you count all the bills and everything that goes into the apartment. But anyway, that is water under the bridge. But her moving out was at the time I felt a bad thing because all of a sudden I felt that crunch from money but if i really look at the last couple of years since that happened yeah she moved out but i transitioned from the job i had which was okay but just didn't pay well into my current job which pays a lot better as a software tester it's a a one where i could sustain myself and make a lot of dumb decisions and i got a wonderful girlfriend And honestly, that probably wouldn't have worked out with my roommate still living here. She probably would have said a bunch of bad things about her and 
somehow convince me not to go with it because it seemed like the kind of person she was. Just like to control people. But I got a wonderful girlfriend and I got a good job and I have a good apartment. And honestly, thing I got, I did the Lightworker Toastmasters. I got my Distinguished Toastmaster Award. I started my podcast. I mean, yeah, it's not exactly what I wanted, but I've done it and I'm moving forward with it. And yeah, I don't want to say anything about like, I don't deserve to be sad or I shouldn't feel sad and down sometimes or want to do a 15 minute, a whole day of just ice cream and binge watching New Girl like I did yesterday. That That's not invalid, just especially with the enormity of everything that's going on with COVID-19 and all the racial unrest and the fact that we have Trump as our president and just all the like normal things just weighing down. But at the same time, I look at my life and honestly, the biggest thing causing me the problems I have is me. And to be blessed to be in a situation where I am my biggest problem is honestly great. Because how many people out there do not have the privilege to be able to get in their own way? How many people out there are having way more things on the outside hurting them and are not able to self-sabotage themselves or their self-sabotages with that as well? So today I decided and this month hopefully I'll continue into thinking about much more of what I, what's going well in my life. And building on that, there's a lot of good things going on in my life. And the fact that, yes, I mean, I think a lot of the problems is when you try to compare something to how you think it's going to be. Accepting things for the reality that they are. And when you can accept the reality that it is, that's when you can push forward and move forward and not let the drag of expectations happen. And because when you expect things to look different than what they are, that is suffering. That's what the Buddha says, at least according to Deepak Chopra. But that suffering is looking at the world and expecting it to be different, expecting things to be different. But when you accept things as they are, that's when you can look at it enjoy it and then also move forward and improve and i just guess i need constant reminders of that just constant and so i hopefully will start doing some of the things i promised myself i would do in january like rebuild my website start doing the quote pictures again i got off that and i'm super behind maybe start adding transcripts because do the quote pictures i pay for it anyway and it's really not that hard if i practice it and get better at it and do two times the speed then it's only like probably only take me like half an hour to maybe an hour to do that but yeah yeah anyway that's what's going on in my life or at least my head my beautiful beautiful head i don't know that's not a good transition but uh, speaking of a good man gonna talk about wt hamilton W.T. is an award-winning author of The Harsh Truths and the creator of the world's first one-chapter book series. He is a business consultant, speaker, and author focused on helping people find customized solutions that work for their personal and business success. Now here's my interview with W.T. Hamilton. Hello, W.T., and welcome to my podcast. Hey, Brett. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. So I take it you're an author. Yeah, I've been known to write a book or two in my spare time. What got you interested in writing? Initially, I was learning about the law of attraction. A lot of it wasn't really driving for me. So I started journaling and writing things that I was learning that things that were working and the things that weren't working. Basically, that was going to be something I could give my kids to give them a jump start. And then my mom was writing as well. And she said she was going to write a book about her experiences. And I told her about stuff that I had wrote. And turns out that became our first book. And that led me to doing all the different types of writing that I'm doing now. Oh, interesting. What about the law of attraction wasn't working for you? It was uh, too spiritual for me and not enough logic. I was kind of looking at it from, because I'm like a a practical, logical type of person and kind of skeptical as well. So I had to really see how does it work? What's the real method behind the secret type of the flashy stuff? But what? how does it really work? How can I really take something, focus on it and put action to it so I can achieve whatever it is I'm trying to achieve? You're not a big believer in sending your intention out into the universe and the universe rearranging everything it can to hand it to you? No, I I know that's what happens, but my part is I don't like to just to sit back. I like to have some action because how I look at it is 
if I could just think everything and it just kind of magically works out for me, I'm going to be pretty bored. I want to feel like I'm doing something as well. So I really look at it as how do I use it to really keep me focused on the goal that I said that I wanted to do, that I can have daily actions, weekly actions, monthly actions to get me there. So I'm curious, what got you interested into the law of attraction, into personal development? What happened was I was working this job I really loved. Everything was great. I had a, a really good high position in that job. I just enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. And then the stock market crashed in 2009. The company went bankrupt. So then I got hired on through an investment firm that took it over and they hired some consultants and they hired me to help them build it back up. But instead of doing the job I was doing, which was production manager and planning and hiring and firing and training people, I had to start doing sales, which I didn't have any experience in. And so I had to learn how to do sales. And as I was learning how to do sales, some of the things that they were doing, I just didn't feel comfortable with. It wasn't, I didn't like the way I was making my money. I didn't like the things that I I had to say because, you know, a lot of times I felt like I had to lie to people to get them to work with us or do whatever because of the way that the, the new place managed. It was completely different from how we used to do things. I started to feel like I need to find a better way to do things and a better ethical code for myself. And then at that time, my mom had seen the movie The Secret. And so she turned me on to that. So did you jump into The Secret and then research more about the law of attraction? Because The Secret is more like a commercial for the law of attraction, but it didn't really show us how. It just told us what you could do but not how to actually make it work. So when we started researching, we found this uh, book called The Master Key. And it was like a really crazy book for me. It was written like a hundred years ago and Mm -hmm. in a language that they talked in that hundred years ago. And I had a hard time resonating with it. And and so that forced me to really look at, you know, why is it that I'm having such a hard time to understand this stuff and other people, it seems to just click. So that's where I started to really start trying to see what could I do? Like, what goal can I set and see if that works? And I was finding little things were easy and they would manifest, but the big things was a more of a struggle. So basically what you're saying, you were able to get the parking space, but not the dream job. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Little things were working out great. Yeah, Anything that was big, and I understand now why, but at that time, it was a kind of a struggle to really understand what the hurdles were and how to get around them. Obviously leads to my next question is, what were the hurdles? A lot of their hurdles really was in believing that you can have it, that you deserve it, and you're worthy of it. A lot of times I would say to myself, yeah, this is what I want. This is what I want to have happen. But I didn't believe that I deserve it, and I didn't believe I was worthy of it. So it was like a fantasy. It was like a wish. But for me to be able to make that transition also meant that I had to look at myself and see so if I want to make $100,000 a year and I'm making $50,000, what is it I got to do to get to that $100,000 level? And then what I found was a lot of it was mindset, was my skills, my habits. They all had to change. I had to do some work to get those to change. And that part, they don't really tell you in the law of attraction because it, it's not as sexy as just saying, hey, just focus on things and say affirmations and it'll happen for you. So what changes in your life did you notice once you start removing these hurdles? The big thing for me was really building up confidence and then learning how to give myself permission to do things instead of waiting for people to give me permission. Because at one point when I was working for that other company, they weren't paying me enough money. They weren't paying me as much money as I was making before the company went bankrupt. And they were always promising they were going to look after us after things picked up. But every time things would pick up when it was getting better and better, they were still holding us back. I accepted that for a long time until the one year, it was just before Christmas. And I was looking at my money and I was realizing like I don't have enough money to buy my kids the presents that they wanted. I started to feel really like a failure, not because I couldn't buy them the presents, but because I allowed someone else to tell me what I was worth and how high I could go and what I could have. And that's when I made that switch and realized I got to take charge and responsible for where I'm at not point fingers at other people and learn how to fix it. And the only way that I could fix it was to give myself permission to move forward and permission to take chances and learn and grow. So what changes in your life did you see after you did that? Immediately, once I started focusing on that mindset, I started finding solutions to my problems instead of excuses and reasons for my problems. And once I was able to start finding solutions, that was opening up the doors. And as that happened, I started feeling more confident, believing more in power of focusing on what I want and 
and always looking forward instead of looking back and complaining. So what actual changes did you see in your life? So the actual changes, one of the things I was able to find a better opportunity. So I was able to leave that company, basically got a job with this other company. And because of how things were structured, I ended up being a consultant for them, which really opened up a whole new world of independence and being able to work from phone and making my own hours. And it was really from taking that leap of faith of saying, I'm worthy of more and I can do more. And so I went and I started looking for exactly what I was, the situation and the circumstances that were going to work the best for myself. What got you into wanting to share your story and help other people or through what, stories, I guess? What I found was with a lot of different things in, in personal development, it's all about really resonating, connecting with people that have been through it and have figured out different little tricks and techniques. When I was listening to other people, some of them I, I couldn't connect with and resonate with, and then there'd be the odd person or the odd story that I'd hear that would just, a light bulb would go off. So I know that it's very important for everybody, no matter who you are or what you're going through, to share your story because someone is going to be re be able to relate to exactly what you're talking about or what you've been through. And if you don't tell that story, that person might never get over that hump because that your voice might be the only voice that they're really going to be able to click with to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So what got you into writing to write it into a story or a parable rather than telling your story? As I started writing the one chapter book, started writing different things of experiences of what I went through, I was finding that because I had done Toastmasters as well, I was finding that there's like power in telling a story as a story, that you remember it more when it's a story than when it's just, here's the facts. So having been able to build mind pictures, build atmosphere, and just make a story memorable, have some memorable sentences in the way that you structure things. I found that was so much more effective, and I kind of started to fall in love with being able to take somebody on that journey. What has it been like promoting your book? Promoting the book has actually been very challenging because two reasons. One, because it's a one-chapter book, something different. So I always have to explain to people you know, what a one-chapter book is and you know why that's cool and the benefits of it. And then just being able to get out there and you got to be the cheerleader for your own product. You got to be the cheerleader for your own book, whatever it is that you're doing. And you have to do that every single day. And you have to do that this month, next month, the month after. It's not like when you hire someone to do a campaign for you, maybe they run a two-week campaign or, or a three-week campaign. This is something that you got to do 24-7 and there's really no end to it. Are you finding that your techniques have helped you through this? Because of uh, being able to focus, what happens is I'm able to set small goals and big goals. And you always find that I have something that I'm looking forward to, something I'm working toward in doing to reach more people and to really just help more people with solutions and with finding how they can do the things that I'm doing as well. What have you liked most about being an author? What I like the most really, it is launching the books. Being able to talk to people and get the feedback from them on what they liked and, and even what they don't like so that I can tweak it for the next one. But it's really that interaction with people and the feedback. And just you, once you've written a book and you're able to get it out there, you start to meet a lot of cool people and you start finding a lot of like minded people that, you know, kind of unexpectedly. That's cool. I've noticed that too with my podcast. But also, something I noticed that, you know, this probably around podcast 85 and I've done 80 interviews, just going through this process has been a huge personal growth process for me, stepping into being the role of a podcast host and promoting all that fun stuff. So as an author going through the promotions, how have you grown as a person? So I'm constantly growing because I'm constantly learning how to, I want to be authentic. So my, the way that I am, I like to have a lot of fun. I like to joke around, but also I'm learning that you have to have a certain amount of professionalism for people to, to take you seriously. So it's trying to find that blend. I'm always kind of working on that blend of being true to who I am, but also presenting it in a way that people are going to understand how that can benefit them. It's a real dance. It's a real kind of balance or battle. So being authentic to and in your marketing can also be very vulnerable. Have you noticed that? And how have you pushed through it if that's been an issue? When I was you know, first doing it, I was trying to, I think I was trying to be like too professional, too cookie cutter. And it wasn't until I was really started to talk about some of the struggles that I've been through and just being as relatable and honest as I can be. That's when things really started to take off. But it's still hard for me because I'm still kind of guarded with how much about, um, especially when it comes to 
things like I don't call them failures. I call them you know, setbacks. But when you do have setbacks and you have struggles, sometimes it's hard to talk about the big struggles that you go through. I try to get through that and share that because I know it helps people. You, people want to see that you can be successful, but they you also have to understand that it's work and it's a challenge and you're going to have risks. And so, the more risks you take, the more chances you have to have setbacks and then have to refigure out what you're going to do and try again. That's one thing I noticed when I was promoting myself as a coach and as a podcast host, especially at the beginning, I would try to create this aura of success, but I noticed that just almost made everything feel like a burden because I had to work so hard keeping up. I don't know a lie, but almost a lie of a mission. I know at one point, I think maybe a few years ago, that was more of things that if you're working with a mentor or a coach, they would push you into. But I think that whole philosophy has gone away and People are just really trying to be as vulnerable and honest and open as they can about what they're doing and where they're at and where they're trying to go. Yeah, I think too many people are renting Lamborghinis and hiring hot chicks and shooting those YouTube videos back in the day. Yeah, exactly. What kind of reception have you gained from your book? It's been kind of a lot of different receptions. So sometimes like when I meet people that don't know me at all, haven't seen me on social media or anything. And I tell them that I've done like a, a one chapter book where the whole book is just one chapter long, solving one business problem at a time. They'll say, oh, that's a cool idea. That sounds really interesting with their words, but with their face, they're giving me a look of, oh, are you crazy, man? What are you, what are you thinking? This is the craziest thing I've ever heard. So I have that. But then in the, the flip side of it, I get reviews and get a lot of great reviews. I've the latest book, The Harsh Truth, I won an award for. It's been a real a roller coaster of reception. Some people are really into it, get it right away. Other people, not sure. And I have to kind of do a little bit of work to even just get them even interested in hearing about it. But it's all part of when you're doing something and you're being authentic and you're really focused on helping a small group of people, then you're not going to resonate with everybody, but you're going to resonate with the right people. And I think if you can get that mindset that you don't have to please everybody, just the people that really need what you're selling or what you're sharing, then it's okay. You can be okay with, I can post a video and it only gets 20 views. I'm fine with that. I can post a video and it only gets three views. I'm fine with that. Even fine if you get one view and one comment that's mean? Yeah. So what I find is that it depends on what the comment is. So if it's constructive, you know, and they're telling me, even if it's mean, but if it has some constructivism in it, then I can take from it that, okay, this person's telling me if I did this differently, next time I'll make a better video or write a better book. But if it's just, they're just being mean just to be mean, I just kind of ignore it. But the hard part is to be able to take the emotions out of any criticism and then really look at what they're saying and seeing if you can find the constructive criticism in there. Because the cr constructive criticism is always free advice of, I would have liked your book better if you had it done this. So there's a lot of people out there who want to write a book. What advice would you give them? So the biggest advice I think is just not worrying too much about how good your book is going to be. Because the more you write, the better you're going to get at it. It's the same as the more that you do anything in life, the better you're going to get at it. But you're never going to get at, good at it if you don't do the first one. I would say just write the first book. I wouldn't go crazy on spending tons of money on it, but I would just get that first book out there, get some feedback, and then you can tweak it. You can do second editions and third editions. And the more that you write, the more you'll learn what your style is and how you want to present, how you want your the whole book to flow. And then you'll start to get better at writing and telling your story. But I know a lot of people are afraid to even do the first one because you get judged. Like once the book is out there, it's out there forever. And that can be very scary for people. Oh, definitely. One of the favorite advice I've ever heard, I believe it was from the co-founder from NLP listening to one of his books is the book you release is 100% better than the book you don't. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And the thing is, I mean, you probably have a good story. It might not be the greatest story ever written, but it's probably a good story and can be tweaked and... If you're open to it, you can get an editor and the editor will help you and they'll make some changes. Some of the changes you might not like, but they'll <laughs> they'll help you with it. If So it just is really all about how much you want to invest in your first book. But I think people get too bogged down in trying to make it perfect and then it never gets past their final draft. So do you have any success stories or like awesome interviews of how your book changed somebody and helped somebody? Because I have uh, a lot of techniques and advice in the books. So I was talking to one of my friends and they had read the book, The, the Luckypreneur. It's really about network marketing. 
And so then she said that once she read, because in it, it, I talk about how basically like what we've just talked about, how to deal with criticism and how to look at success. And so she said once she read that, it helped her to really go out there and be fearless in how she approaches people and not worry so much about, because a lot of times she was worrying about what people are going to think or what they're going to say or how they're going to react to her. That book was able to help her to see that you can just go out there and be yourself and have fun and connect with people in a genuine way instead of always trying to get out there and and just hand out your business card. And and so as she read through that and she started practicing that, she said it really made a a big impact on how she was able to network more successfully. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. So we're coming to the end of our time together. One thing I like to ask my guests is to do a one minute of motivation. You can think of this as if you have a time machine and you're going back in time into your eight-year-old self and you want to convey the information you need to live a happy and joyful life. But unfortunately, you're plopped back into the future in one minute. Or you can think of it as condensing your entire life message, your entire life's purpose into a minute. So are you ready? Okay. So the thing that I would tell myself is just believe in yourself more than you believe in the opinion of other people. Because the more that you can see yourself being successful, the more successful you're going to be. And you're going to have some hard times where nobody's going to care what you're doing and you're going to feel like you're completely on your own, but you're never on your own. Because as long as you have yourself, you have more than enough to strive and get to where you want to get to. You just have to keep on going and it's all going to work out. That's the advice that I would give myself if I could go back in time. Thank you so much, WT, for coming on my podcast. I very much enjoyed listening to your story on how the law of attraction wasn't fitting you. Instead of just ditching it, you're able to look into it and go underneath and notice what didn't work and building the confidence and the acceptance that you need to be able to go out and do what you want and leave that job and to find a one that's better and more fulfilling and fitting to you. And then also to take that extra step into writing a story because since the dawn of time, we have taught our lessons and our history through story. So it's just an amazing way to connect with people. So thank you so much for coming on my podcast and thank you so much for what you do for this world. Yeah, and I, I want to thank you for having me on your podcast. I really enjoyed it and I really loved your questions. It got me thinking on the spot and it was, it was great to be able to share in this way. May your day be special. <laughs> thank you. And there you have it, folks. That is my interview with W.T. Hamilton. Wow, one chapter books and writing all those books. That is really cool. The law of attraction has been an interesting thing for me. I love a lot of the tenets for it as I, well, if you listen to my podcast, you know, I'm not a big believer in the law of attraction as a whole, but like WT, I find a lot of good principles in the law of attraction, especially in the seeing yourself as successful and the positive visualization aspect I do believe is helpful. Because it's a way for you to see yourself as successful. Because as he said, if you don't see yourself as successful, then you're not going to be successful. And what's the point? It's not going to be as fun. It's just going to be a drag. Who wants a drag? I know I don't. And so it was very helpful, I thought, in thinking about it that way. Being able to see yourself as you want to be and then put it into action. And hopefully his books will help you do that. So if you want to know more about W.T. Hamilton, you could check out his new website, yourinvinciblepower.com, as well as Instagram, which is w.t.hamilton. So there you have it, folks. That is episode 76 of the Joyce Expansion Podcast. I am on a roll with interviews. I have at least 10 more to go, so I am super excited at how everything is building up. So again, if you want to get in touch with me, you can email me at bre2ts, dupr2es, at joyceexpansion.com. You can check my website out, joyceexpansion.com, or episodes of pod.joyceexpansion.com. Of course, you can leave a like, subscribe, review, whatever you can do to share this and get this out there and help me help you and help me you can also find me at joyous expansion at instagram linkedin twitter but not facebook because i'm increase your joy because i suck at seo yes this is episode 76 of the joyous expansion podcast i love you for who you are because you are listening to my voice right now so once again i'm brought to pre the champion of authentic joy joyous expansion life causing catalyst of transformation for the church of awesome 
Reminding you to be love, to be joy, to be awesome. Now play that jingle. JoyousExpansion.com JoyousExpansion.com Come and say hello to Brad Dupree. He is an inspirational life coach. Good for you and good for me. He turned my life from gray to blue. I'm sure he'll do the same for you. Get in touch and you'll see. Your life will change dramatically. JoyousExpansion.com JoyousExpansion.com Yeah!